The new Russia begins in 1812. Alexander Ivanovich Herzen. In the Winter Palace in St. Petersburg, there is a military gallery dedicated to the Patriotic War of 1812. The gallery presents 332 portraits of Russian generals. However, if you look closely at the generals that are featured here, you will notice that almost half of them have English, German, and sometimes even French last names. These names are highlighted in yellow. Despite the fact that most places of birth and death are timidly hushed up, you may find that some of them were born in a European country and also died somewhere in Western Europe, most likely fulfilling their duty to our homeland. This photo shows generals, heroes of the War of 1812, who have particularly distinguished themselves. They all have orders on their chest, and in addition to their Russian awards, there are also European awards. Let's look at these awards in more detail. General Pyotr Ivanovich Bagration. The medals displayed here pertain only to the countries against which, as per the official account, the Russian generals fought with. On Bagration, we see an Austrian order, which could hardly be considered Prussian. The order of the Black Eagle that we see in the middle was a knightly order given to those who swore allegiance to the knightly order of Prussia while at the same time, the official version states that he was sent to fight the King of Prussia. General of the Cavalry Matvey Ivanovich Platov had two Austrian orders and two Russian ones, while also being presented as a knight of the Russian royal house. General Field Marshal Mikhail Ilyayonovich Golenichev Kutuzov, Prince of Smolensk. Among the European awards, he has a small Austrian order, hardly Prussian, and at the same time, he was also a knight of the Russian royal house. Pay attention to some of the awards that we can observe on Kutuzov's chest. Despite the fact that, according to the official version, Russia was at war with France, countries like Prussia and Austria were all allies of France, which also took part in hostilities against Russia. For the portraits that were painted in this gallery, the generals did not hesitate to carry the orders of these enemy countries. General Field Marshal Mikhail Barclay de Tali, a man with a distinctly French surname, who until August 24, 1812, served as Minister of War of the Russian Empire. Apart from the Russian and Austrian orders, he also had two French orders, and at the same time, he had the Order of Saint Louis, so Barclay was a French knight. General Mikhail Andreevich Miloradovich. He also has Austrian and Prussian orders, but at the same time, he was also a knight of the Prussian royal house. And here we have the Emperor of all Russia, Tsar of Poland, Grand Duke of Finland, Protector of the Order of Malta, Alexander Pavlovich Ramonov. He boasts a great number of foreign accolades, many more than other generals. It's worth mentioning that he held two French chivalric orders, including the highly esteemed Order of the Holy Spirit, the most prestigious distinction among the French nobility and clergy. In the comments section of part one of this series, I received several criticisms of not considering the documents and manuscripts related to the Patriotic War of 1812. It turned out that the Russian State Library created a whole website dedicated to the War of 1812. Here there is also a manuscript section, which are presented in PDF format, and although these documents are digitized, they are not visible in general searches. The documents here are very few. But here I will read the most important ones. You can visit this website and personally read these documents at any time. The Manifesto of Emperor Alexander I, June 25th, 1812. This manifesto was published on the outbreak of the war. The manifesto was written by hand by someone with the initials N.A., but was subsequently signed by Alexander I. Despite the fact that the manifesto was essentially an appeal to the military, for some reason it was written in French, not Russian. The next file, 
Decree of Appeal to the Troops of February 5th, 1813 by Alexander I. It states that the presented document here was translated from Russian into French in the printed form. But where is the original copy in Russian? Why isn't the original one shown to us? The Journal of the Bee of the Headquarters of the Russian Army, published in 1813. The Journal of the Bee of the Headquarters of the Russian Army, published in 1813. Yet again, we have another handwritten form that is in French. The question still stands, was this the Russian army or not? I finally came across a document that was in Russian. This one's called The Justification of Commander-in-Chief Barclay de Tali, his actions during the Patriotic War of 1812 with the French. He explains in detail the impossibility of engaging in battle in the early stages of the war but that there is a need for systematic preparation for this battle, as well as having the ability to retreat the Russian army. It seems that this document reveals the main intrigue of the behavior of Russian troops during the War of 1812. However, on closer inspection, it turns out that this document was finally drawn up in December of 1821. But as we know from Barclay de Tali's biography, he died in 1818. So either this document was written by Mikhail Barclay de Tali, or the document was written much later than the date of his death. Here we see a letter from Kutuzov to Gavril Petrovich Yermolov. This is not the same Alexis Petrovich Yermolov, the war hero, the famous liberator of the Caucasus, but his uncle, who was a non-commissioned officer of the guard. This letter is dated from 1865. It is quite possible that this note was already made by the son of Gavril Petrovich. This is not so important among the letters that I wanted to see. Where is the correspondence between Alexander I and Napoleon? Where is the connection between Kutuzov and Napoleon or the connection between Kutuzov and Alexander I? Another document in Russian, which is called The Presentation of General of Infantry Barclay de Tali to Emperor Alexander I on the Movement of the Army in 1812. Interestingly, the document attributes the loss of Moscow to external factors and states that the Russian troops were ordered to leave the city by unknown persons superior in rank to Barclay de Tali. Initially, I thought I had finally found a report in Russian that was written during the War of 1812. However, at the end of the manuscript, there's an excerpt from a poem by Alexander Sergeyevich Pushkin, which he wrote in 1835. And as a result, the manuscript was written much later. And again, it is not clear by whom. Alexander Sergeyevich dedicated this poem to Barclay de Tali. I will now read the passage to you. I ask you to think about the meaning of this passage. The unlucky vegetable was your fate. You brought all the sacrifice of a foreign land, impenetrable at the sight of the wild scoundrel. In silence did not walk alone thoughts of the great. And in your name, I didn't like the sound of a stranger. They chase you with their screams. People mysteriously saved by you, I swore on your sacred gray hair. As is clear from the above passage, writers and poets of the time were all aware of this situation, not only from the start of the war, but also in 1812. But they were forbidden from telling the truth. In the description of the video, I will link to this page and you will be able to see for yourself that there are very few significant manuscripts from the War of 1812. It seems that these are the only remaining letters which confirm the official version. In chapter 1 of the video, 1812, War of the Worlds, I showed the similarity of the army uniforms of Napoleon and Alexander I. In that video's comments section, even opponents admitted that the color of the uniform was not a hallmark of the two armies, and this is true since it was a single uniform, a single one Imperial Army. The main idea being this, in order to not make it obvious that the armies were fighting on the same side, much later the uniform color green was assigned to Russian divisions, and blue for the French, Austrians, Poles, etc. A few examples. Here is a painting of the Battle of 1812. Where are the Russians? Where are the French? I think the answer is obvious. The Russians are in green uniforms. Here's another example. The Table of Operations of the Grand Army, August 21st, 1812. 
The troops are designated in green and blue. It's obvious that the colors were not chosen by chance. This map I have already shown, the Borodino Village Battle Plan. Again, we see that the color of the French troops are blue and that the Russian troops are green. It is obvious that the colors of the troops were chosen according to the colors of the uniforms, according to which it was subsequently decided to divide the troops. Another example, here is a modern painting, the French in dark blue uniforms and the Russians in green. Why didn't the author draw all the soldiers with the same color for the uniforms? Here's an illustration of an equestrian hunter in full dress, almost turned away from us. What army does this soldier belong to, French or Russian? In fact, this hunter belongs to the French army, despite the fact that the uniform is green. With such similar uniforms, how could they be against each other? Until 1812, the French army was dressed in old-fashioned blue uniforms. This uniform was a frock coat with long pleats tied in the middle of the chest which opened the jacket worn by the soldier. In the spring of 1812, by decree of the emperor, a new green uniform was introduced into the French army. It was a jacket that was tied at the waist and completely hid the waistcoat. The folds of the uniform were 22 centimeters shorter than those of the old uniform. However, this decree did not apply to the Imperial Guard and all the other guards, with the exception of the newly created Regiment of Grenadiers, who continued to wear the old model of uniform until the very end of the Napoleonic epoch. Naturally, before the invasion of Russia, the industry did not have time to change all the uniforms for the whole great Napoleonic army, and most of the French regiments fought in Russia in old-fashioned uniforms. After the defeat and death of the Grand Army, the newly created regiments were immediately equipped with old uniforms of the model from 1812. But due to their shortage, old stocks of uniforms were also used. In addition to the Imperial Guard infantry, rear and reserve units fought with the uniforms that they already had. Thus, until the very collapse of the Napoleonic Empire, the French army used both uniforms, the old and the new models. I also found such a picture of the Russian model with a description in French. Can anyone say leprechaun? In the top left, a hunter is depicted in a rather unusual headdress. This hat is not typical of Russian troops. However, it was these headdresses that were used during the War of 1812 in North America. The War of 1812 left monuments that confirmed the version that Russian troops fought on the same side as the French troops. Near Smolensk, there is a monument dedicated to Major General Anton Skalon, who according to the official version, died during the defense of Smolensk. It says that the French general was buried on March 8, 1812, in the royal bastion in the presence of the great Emperor Napoleon, with all military honors. Apparently, Napoleon learned that the general had a French surname and decided to bury him in his presence. Not far from the region of Belshiev Zyazmi, there is a monument on which a rather strange inscription is written. Here it is written that the monument was erected in memory of the interruption of the Russian and French armies in August of 1812. This is Kutuzov's tomb in the Cathedral of Our Lady of Kazan, located in St. Petersburg. The tomb is crowned with a French eagle, which is hoisted on the icon. According to legend, it is in front of this icon that Mikhail Iryanovich prayed. To the left and to the right of the tomb, there are no Russian flags, but French flags surmounted by a French eagle. These are officially considered trophy flags. The anomalies of Kutuzov don't end there. In the French book, Napoleon's History of the Grand Commander, which was published in St. Petersburg and Moscow in 1912, there is a photograph which is referred to as Kutuzov's hut near Moscow. It is the same hut where Kutuzov sits while Napoleon was in Moscow, according to the official version. Apparently, a museum was made later from this hut. The most interesting part is that on the right side of the photo, there is a portrait not of Alexander I or Peter I, but of Napoleon Bonaparte. This is a famous portrait of Paul Delaroche. The photo was taken much later, but no one even thought about taking down this portrait. What other explanation could there be other than Kutuzov fighting well alongside Napoleon? 
This photo shows a monument at the site of the French crossing to the student village in 1812. The monuments contain the portraits of Alexander I and Napoleon Bonaparte, although now the portraits have been modified and which were previously depicted on another page of this book. The two emperors are depicted in marble sculptures, both sporting the Roman civic crown. Upon initial inspection, it can be challenging to differentiate between the two emperors, but it becomes clear once the label at the bottom of the picture is read. According to history, this is where the army of Alexander I dealt a tangible blow to the French army and essentially destroyed it. However, if one were to examine the profile of the emperors without prior knowledge, it would not be immediately evident. The two rulers are represented on an equal footing, as well as on dozens of other monuments and medals. It is evident that even a hundred years later, ideas about the War of 1812 were completely different. Here's another excerpt that belongs to the period when Napoleon took Moscow. Here it is written, Alexander I did not enter into peace negotiations, and Napoleon himself wrote a letter to the Tsar expressing his sadness at the fire in Moscow. The letter went unanswered. The Russian Tsar had relied on the will of Providence. He did not listen to the advice of the generals, and only repeated, All this is the hand of the Almighty. He completely surrendered to fate, and only said, Napoleon or me, we cannot rule together. Why was he saying that? Couldn't Napoleon and Alexander share power? In the same book, we also have an illustration of a rather interesting picture. Here it says, Alexander I presents the Bashkirs, the Kalmyks, and other foreigners of the Russian army to Napoleon, July 7, 1807. Can the Russian army, where nearly half of the generals were foreigners, and Alexander I himself first addressed them in French, be referred to as such? If this painting is really depicting Alexander I presenting Napoleon with Bashkirs, Kalmyks, Cossacks, and so on, then why is he standing on the other side? And one last thing immediately catches my attention. The foreigners presented are all wearing headdresses, just like Napoleon and Alexander I while the rest of the officers stand without hats. If all these foreigners, as has been said, really served in the Russian army, then why are they not bareheaded in the presence of the Supreme Sovereign? With this painting in mind, we can only conclude that these people were of the same rank. I think this is the last meeting of representatives from the Western and Eastern worlds. And in this painting, we see the Khans from different kingdoms. Apparently, the parties did not come to some sort of agreement, and on the same day, Alexander I made the Peace of Tilsit with Napoleon, and five years later, the war began. In Chapter 1, I showed a book by John James titled A Travel Magazine in Germany, Sweden, Russia, and Poland. There I gave a detailed description of how Napoleon blew up the Kremlin. I found a French illustration called The Kremlin Explosion. Official history tells us that the military was a declining army, but there are already several confirmations that everything was probably going wrong. That leads us to questioning the official version. Did the Kremlin really explode? Is there any further confirmation of this fact? In the book entitled, Materials for the History of Emperor Alexander I in His Time, there is a mention in the draft medal, which represents Emperor Alexander I just like St. George of Lida on horseback striking a monster with a spear. Her left arm is fitted with a shield with the image of an all-seeing eye, where it is written the date 1812, with the Kremlin exploding in the distance. Apparently, the medal was not approved, although it would be interesting to see it. There are several metal designs in this book, with Alexander I killing a serpent. In the future, they apparently decided to abandon this idea, and instead of Alexander I, they placed the image of an unknown young man. This painting was attributed to a representation of St. George of Lida. The plot of the painting was also borrowed from another famous painting by Napoleon Bonaparte. What was Napoleon trying to destroy in Moscow? In a document titled, The Towers and Walls of the Kremlin Existing and Destroyed by Enemies, in 1812, 
I found the following illustration of the Kremlin Wall. On the roof of the tower, there is a cross which is not familiar to us, but an incomprehensible structure. What could it possibly be? Pay attention to the name of the document. It was no secret that these items were deliberately destroyed. And here is another similar document. It shows another tower, and above it, we also see an incomprehensible pattern. Some say that this could be an antenna for receiving static electricity from the atmosphere, which modern scientific theories deem as possible. We know that Count Kutuzov corresponded with Napoleon, and when the French took Moscow, according to the official version, the people's militia were very strong, and this militia attacked the French, who were walking alone or behind the detachments. Naturally, they did not stand at the ceremony with these French, and Napoleon turned to Kutuzov. The following sentence states, Made on September 23rd, he demanded to stop the People's War, which, being excited and supported by partisans, brought such terrible harm to the enemy, replied the Marshal. The people understand this war as an invasion of the Tartars, and therefore considers all means to get rid of enemies who are not only passive, but laudable and sacred. A very strange request from Napoleon, as the commander of the army that destroyed the towns and villages of Russia. But when looking at the situation from another perspective, where the armies of Kutuzov and the armies of Napoleon fought on the same side, everything falls into place. Naturally, the people resisted the invaders and Napoleon turned to the Russian-speaking general in the hope that he would come to an agreement with people who also spoke Russian so that they would stop the resistance. On another page of this book, the author tries to clarify the following assertion during the movement into Moscow, which was incomprehensible already 50 years after the war, stating, he never had an enemy behind Napoleon. You can read for yourself what the author wrote in the description below. I suggest you read the explanations, confirming that Napoleon never had an enemy behind him. In the French newspaper called The Journal of the Empire, in which described the events of the war in the East, I found the following article. The flags taken by the Russians from the Turks in different wars, and several curious things found in the Kremlin, have left for Paris. Just like that, valuable information was sent to the rear. But here, a reasonable question arises of what was valuable in this information. Flags, statistics. It is quite possible that they were precious witnesses of the past who were present in Moscow. Almost all of the paintings that depict Napoleon's campaign in Moscow only show Napoleon on horseback, confirming that it was a military campaign in the general sense. However, the Parisian Museum contains a copy of the carriage on which Napoleon made round trips to Moscow. It is a pity that the museum does not specify how many times Napoleon visited Moscow in this photo. Something that is unknown of the War of 1812 is the question of why Golenyshev Kutuzov received the title of Prince of Smolensk. In this document entitled The Representation of Hostilities of 1812, attributed to Barclay de Tali, an order is given with the text for the attribution of this title. The following is written in memory of the unforgettable merits of our Marshal and Prince Golenyshev Kutuzov. Before leading many enemy troops by his own skillful movement and multiple victories to complete exhaustion, extermination and flight, especially for inflicting a strong defeat on the enemy in the vicinity of Smolensk, which was followed by the liberation of this famous city, and enemies hastily persecuted and eliminated from Russia, we grant it the title of Smolensk. It is obvious that this is the Battle of Krasnoy, which took place from November 15th to November 18th of 1812. However, this battle took place 45 kilometers from Smolensk, and according to the official version, the retreating French army did little to damage the city. Exactly what kind of liberation are we talking about, in which the title of Prince of Smolensk is granted? With the same success, it was possible to award him the title of Prince of Borodino or even of Moscow. Obviously, 
This Kutuzov title was the official version, just trying to explain this fact in some way. The same page describes the reason why Kutuzov received the Imperial and Military Order of St. George, Martyr and Victorious, First Class. It is recorded that the grateful monarch, along with his entire entourage, conducted a divine liturgy to honor Marshal and Prince Golenichev Kutuzov of Smolensk, who had been instrumental in freeing Russia from the disgraceful foreign domination. Knight Commander of the Imperial and Military Order of St. George, Martyr and Victor, First Class. What was later called the Mongol Tartar Yoke has always been called a shameful yoke in Russia. To compare the French army's campaign along the road to Smolensk is more than ridiculous. Especially since Napoleon has not yet succeeded in putting a yoke in place, I think very few people will argue with that. But according to this note, it did not really collapse in Russia until 1812. One of the most incomprehensible stories of the War of 1812 is Napoleon's expectation of certain boyars near Moscow. Who are these boyars expected by Napoleon? After all, such a domain in Russia, according to official history, has not existed for a long time. Here is a French illustration which is titled, The Entry of the French Army Under the Command of the Emperor Napoleon to the City of Moscow. One can see these boyars. Pay attention to such people's clothes and hats. The illustration does not show Napoleon entering the city with a musical orchestra. The entire illustration is a theater of absurdity. The townspeople took to the streets to meet the French, and at this time, the town towers were set on fire and destroyed by the fire, and the artist is an eyewitness to this event. Obviously not. Moscow is rather drawn in the European style. Apparently, the artist drew these illustrations from the events they described. And such illustrations give reason to believe that some boyars were really there, and it is quite possible that they committed betrayals and opened the doors for Napoleon. Another illustration, titled, The Entry of the French into Moscow. Why is it that in these French artists' illustrations, they are constantly describing events that deviate from the version that's described in our textbooks? Again, the city here also looks very European. On the tower, we see a symbol that looks more like an antenna than a cross. In 1869, the French cartographer and explorer Charlie Joseph Menard drew a map of the decline in the number of troops of the Grand Army. What still causes a lot of controversy, according to this map, is that 422,000 soldiers were lost in Russia, but according to the same map, the army began to disappear even before the start of the freeze on their way back to Paris. For example, after Vitebsk, there were only 175,000 people left, and after the Battle of Smolensk, only 145,000, while according to the official averages, in the Battle of Smolensk on the French side, 14,000 soldiers were killed and wounded. Where are the remaining 16,000? They just disappeared? After the Battle of Smolensk, according to this map, Napoleon lost two-thirds of his army. How was it possible to go further into enemy lines? Only 100,000 people reached Moscow, less than a quarter of the army. Menard's map gives reason to say that Napoleon's army dissolved in Russia. Let's see if there is any confirmation that this may be true. In the book entitled Historical Essays and Student Articles in 1812, published on the occasion of the 100th anniversary of the war, the author gives a description of the meeting of the last of the veterans of the Grand Army. It tells the story of a certain Lieutenant Nikolai Andreevich Savini, who, together with Napoleon, participated in the Egyptian campaign and in 1812 came with the Grand Army to Russia. It is written that on the way back under the Berezina, his detachment was defeated and he was captured by the Cossacks, including Platov himself, who was saved from lynching. Since then, he has stayed in Russia, and Russia has become his second home. But at the same time, and for some reason, he moved, not near the Dnieper, but in Saratov, and this fact once again confirms the version that Napoleon nevertheless reached the Volga. Nikolai Andreevich Savini died in 1894 
at the age of 126. Of course, here it is doubtful that this soldier could have lived so long and most likely participated in the Crimean War, which, as you know, was also Napoleon, but the third. But it's a slightly different story. Why is it that after a hundred years they tried to find veterans of the War of 1812? In the Ural Mountain region, there are villages that have names of European capitals, like Paris, Berlin, Leipzig, and other cities. The village of Paris even has its own Eiffel Tower. These names were given by the Cossacks, who fought in the wars of 1799, as well as the soldiers of 1813 and 1814, who were sent to serve Western Siberia. Could these Cossacks possibly be French? This painting shows the enlistment by the Cossacks of Poles, captured from Napoleon's army in 1813. Karamzin's drawing represents the moment of the arrival of the captured Poles in Omsk, after they had already been assigned to the Cossack regiments under the supervision of the Siberian army of the Cossack Council of Mr. Isal Nabokov. One by one, you can see the change in the Cossack uniforms. Dear viewers, these historical versions expressed in this video are private opinions. They do not claim to be the only accurate account of past events and are published for information only. Sergei Ignatenko